perseverance allows me to love the Lord my God with everything that I am. Yes, sir. To put him first and not anything else. Amen? Right. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on. He's saying, get dressed in tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another. to say thank you. Lord, we thank you for knowing exactly what we need even before we ask. Lord, we thank you for being an all-knowing God and for supplying our every need according to your riches and glory by Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for never leaving us or forsaking us. Lord, we thank you for being our shepherd, for taking care of us and never leaving us in mourning. Lord, I thank you that whenever we ask, it is given to us. Whenever we seek, Lord, we find, and whenever we knock, you open doors for us that can't be closed. Lord, I thank you that you renew our strength and give us peace for our souls. Lord, I thank you that you restore to us what was destroyed. You allow us to be the head and not the tail, first and not the last, above and not below the top and not the bottom. Lord, we thank you for providing your only Son, Jesus the Christ, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Lord, you are Jehovah Jireh. And so, Lord, we say thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 He's worthy to receive what we give him. Amen. And he knows how to handle it. Isn't that right? <laughs> Amen. I would ask you to turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Good to see each of you all this morning and want to acknowledge those of you who are watching virtually. Romans chapter 12. Familiar two verses. We hear this a lot. And it is applicable to our focus this month on stewardship. You see the words in your text. You see the words on the screen. From the New King James Version, Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This morning from this passage, I just want to talk about principles for stewardship. We're going to launch off here and then go to some other places, but I just want you to think about this morning how God works mercy in your life. The fact that he works mercy in your life. I mean, just think about God's mercy to you. Mercy is a little different than grace. Uh, it it's, not, it's, it's God not giving us what we do deserve. <laughs> Mercy is God willingly forgiving and providing for us rather than punishing and cutting us off when we've done wrong. <laughs> That's why Lamentations 3.23 telling us his mercies are new every morning is so encouraging to us. God's mercy is at the center of these two verses here in Romans 12. Our response to God's mercy is revealed in the first part of the verse one where it says, I beseech you therefore. Uh, we know, and last time I shared with you, 
We, we, we saw that Paul had just concluded uh, the 11th chapter of this letter to the Romans. He had interrupted his deep teaching to them by suddenly bursting out in an uplifting, powerful and profound uh, praise and worship to God. All because of God's wondrous, generous and amazing mercy in that right. Uh, by his mercy, God chooses to redeem both Jews and Gentiles. Uh, he chooses to save them in spite of their, our rebellion, in spite of our disobedience, in spite of our idolatry. God mercifully saves sinners even though we don't deserve to be saved. Therefore, because of that awesome mercy, Paul begins chapter 12 by calling every believer to wholly give ourselves, wholly offer ourselves as sacrifices to God in response to God's mercy. He's asking us to respond to what God has done. A steward is one who takes care of something for someone else, usually in their absence. A stewardship is what one does with that which has been committed and entrusted to their care. If you were a steward in ancient Greek culture, you were not the owner of the house. Instead, you would have been the manager of the house the manager of the household affairs, from making sure the home was clean to managing the finances and, and likely managing the servants. You would have managed everything on behalf of the owner. So as Pastor Norville explained, stewardship is more than how we handle our money. It's more than what we do with our treasure. Stewardship goes beyond Tithing. Uh, stewardship includes handling of our time, our talent, our testimony, and our temple as well. Uh, each of these are resources the Lord has called us to steward. And you remember, back in 2019, Pastor Lasseter took us through those T words, amen, as part of our uh, orientation as we came together. So, so, so often, <laughs> being a steward, using or making the most of what we've received from God requires a sacrifice on our part, all right? This stewardship thing and this sacrifice thing, huh, it comes together. In this text, Paul calls on his readers, based on the depth of God's mercy toward us, to present ourselves, to offer ourselves, to manage uh, all he has given us, look, not as prepared, capable believers, not as determined, able-bodied men and women, <laughs> not even as an obedient, surrendered child of God, but as a living sacrifice. <clears throat> that means your understanding of stewardship <clears throat> affects the way you live your life for the glory of God. Yeah. Thank you. A sacrifice in scripture is an official offering prescribed by God. It's an offering accepted by the Lord because it's given on his terms. Uh, uh, this verse really brings to mind the goat sacrifice uh, on, on the Day of Atonement in Leviticus ch chapter 16. The high priest on that day, that one day of the year, uh, uh, made a sin offering using, among other animals, he used two goats. Uh, the two goats were used as a single sin offering for the people, though only one of the goats was killed. The one goat, called the escape goat, symbolized the full removal of the people's sins. 
Uh, leading the goat away into the wilderness represented the removal of the people's sins carried away in the depths of God's forgiveness. Carried away, mind you, never to return. <laughs> the second goat, called the Lord's goat, was killed as a sacrifice. And that sacrifice symbolized atonement, uh, the covering of sin provided through the shedding of blood, which, of course, represents Jesus Christ. It's a picture of what Jesus would do for us in bringing us back to God. Uh, the thing here I want you to do is to imagine that goat. Imagine that sacrifice. He's tied to the altar. He's calm and still just standing there. And, and he may or may not have known it, but he's standing there waiting for his throat to be slit. Huh? It reminds us of young, strong Isaac willingly becoming a sacrifice, exposing himself for the knife of his aging father Abraham as a ready offering. Here I am. It reminds us of what happens when two dogs are fighting. When the one dog is, knows he's beaten, he, he exposes his throat to the other dog and says, hey, I give up. You can kill me if you want to. That's us, y'all. We ought to see ourselves as offered up to God on his terms, willingly offering ourselves and serving God according to his desire, according to his requirements. A living, everyday offering, partly because you're giving yourself in managing what God has given to you. My brothers and sisters, <laughs> God has a logical plan for us. That's part of the meaning of this thing. And we're saying when we understand we're a sacrifice to him, we're saying, hey, I I'm willing to get in line with your plan to use what I have, amen, for your glory. Hmm. And, and, and that's the way we ought to think about that phrase, our reasonable service. <laughs> It's a logical, meaningful thing. Amen. It's giving all we are and all we have to the Lord, consecrating ourselves, holding nothing back, offering all we have for him to use as he chooses. Biblical stewardship is one of the primary ways Christ calls you to live your life. It's, it, it, it is the Christian lifestyle. Someone asks, why? <laughs> you know, what, what gives God the right to require this stewardship lifestyle of us? It sounds like I can't do what I want to do. <laughs> First, the, the, the Bible has a lot to say about stewardship. And what we're going to do uh, from the rest of our time is look at seven principles from Bible scriptures that present some keys and some understanding, some reasons why and how uh, this biblical stewardship works and, and how it's in order. The first uh, thing I want to say, first principle for stewardship is simply the Lord created everything. You know that one, Genesis 1.1. And I want you to think about this thing now. A creator not only has the vision, the ideas, and the inspiration for the creation, but the creator also has the wherewithal, the know-how, the materials, and most importantly, the ability, huh? the power to create. And certainly that's all that, that that's completely the case with God, our creator, the ultimate creator. Y'all church stewardship is a theme in the Bible. You can trace from Genesis all the way to Revelation. 
And it begins with the very first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It begins right there. I mean, speaking of the Godhead, unity and diversity, it affirms the three persons of divinity having executed the origin and the orderly continuation of a vast universe wherein only one planet has life. That's something, y'all. And then it follows through to the first chapter of John where the role of God, the man named Jesus, is given preeminence, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and not anything was made that was made, amen, without him. Our Lord Jesus created everything. He created the universe. He created the planets. He created you and I. Even the minute particles of dust were created by him. And I'm just simply saying the absolute fact of the triune God being creator is the first and primary, the beginning of all the stewardship principles. <laughs> it begins with the fact God made everything. And that theme is picked up in the book of Colossians in 1, 15 and 16, where we read, uh, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. All things were created through him and for him. He created for himself. That's the, the foundation for biblical stewardship. But then the, the, the second principle uh, provides us uh, uh, this thought. Uh, not only did God create everything, but God owns everything. <laughs> You remember Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they who dwell therein. This is the strength of biblical stewardship principles, the fact that God not only created, but then God owns. And, 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 and biblical stewardship has to do with understanding our lives are not our own, huh? That's what they were just singing in that song. When we say, I give myself away, we don't give it to take it back, amen? Uh, we give it <laughs> because it belongs to him. <laughs> and I have to say to us as believers, we're on twice, <laughs> right? I mean, think about it. Uh, we're on twice because uh, we've been bought with a price by Jesus at the cross, right? And we already said he created everything, so we are, we're on twice. And I just have to say for those in the worship, maybe watching virtually, who have not yet trusted Christ, for those who may see the world differently, not the way I'm explaining from this passage today, I have to say to you, whether you accept it or not, your life is on loan from God. And God calls you to steward everything about your life for his glory and for the good of others. We're going to focus on that in a minute. Not only did God, the Lord, create everything, but he owns everything. I mean, it's interesting. In, in, in Luke, excuse me, in Job 41, verse 11, uh, uh, he God is speaking to Job there, getting him straight, you remember, at the end of the book. And he's explaining why he doesn't need to purchase anything, okay? I don't need to make any purchase. I don't need to buy anything. And he says, the reason is because everything under heaven is mine. So God has given us our life to steward for his glory and for our own good. As the owner of everything, the Lord desires for all things to be redeemed, that is, reconciled. You can read Colossians 1.20 on that. Uh, he, he desires everything to be reconciled, redeemed. I mean, I'm talking about people, governments, business, arts, the environment. It all ought to work according to his plan. To say it another way, to say it the way 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, 
God desires for everything to bring him glory. It simply says, whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, huh? Do all. Do all to the glory of God. And I'm simply saying things on earth are redeemed when they are bringing their owner, God, glory. Well, that's the second principle. The third principle is uh, not only he, he creates everything, he owns everything, but the Lord delegates responsibility. He delegates responsibility. Now think with me, uh, Genesis 1, 26 through 28. I'm going to read that to you. Uh, it says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have what? Dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Again, he says, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Church, it was God's choice from the very beginning to give us authority and a responsibility to lead his creation according to his will. Look, God delegated authority to us. God gave us responsibility. If I need to say this, <laughs> notice this truth about delegating. <laughs> Y'all, T group leaders and others, we mess up when we try to do it all ourselves. We mess up. Think about this thing. I mean, the Lord can do it all, yet he decided to delegate to us. He, he gave us dominion as his image bearers, and, and so Christ involves us in managing his creation. When we think about it, we all know the three persons of the Trinity have never farmed, they've never erected a building, they've never raised a baby, but when we look with our eyes of faith, we can see the Lord meeting the needs of people, bringing people to faith in him and tending to his creation through millions and millions of other people all around the world. This theme of our being used in God's work is picked up by Paul in his first letter to the church at Corinth. He says, for we are God's Fellow workers. We're workers with God, he's saying in verse uh, chapter 3, verse 9. God has enlisted each of us like soldiers in the military to serve as his arms and hands, his legs, his feet, and his eyes. God is at work in your life and in the lives of people all around the world. And as a believer, you have responsibility, amen, to fulfill his will. This is the biblical way to think about our roles as stewards. And as we read through the Bible, we see the countless people the Lord delegated responsibility to. Jesus builds his church through our participation as we live out and share the gospel. That's the beauty of that one generation sharing with the next generation coming up. Amen. Teaching them <laughs> to do what they do. So church, when we eat our waffle, I don't know about y'all, I like waffles, but when you eat your waffle for breakfast... <laughs> The Lord provided it for you through the work of farmers and bakers, truck drivers and grocery stores. And I'm just saying that he works through and has always used people. You get the point. Y'all, we steward, we said a minute ago, for his glory and for the good of others. That's, that's, what we, that's why he called us to steward, for his glory and the good of others. 
And I think it's interesting uh, looking at these principles as they came out in uh, scripture as, as I was looking, we see three of the principles, the first three focus on what God does, how he establishes stewardship. But then the last four talk about us, our involvement in stewardship, okay? So, so we wanna move to the fourth principle, and the fourth principle says, we personally steward resources. Huh? You and I personally are stewards of resources. Some may have more, some may have less, but we all have resources. And remember, those five T words, they're all resources, amen? It's not just what money we have in our pocket or in our bank account. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 11 and 12 say this, aspire to live a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your hands as we command you that you may walk properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. Remember those Thessalonians had a problem because they were looking for the coming of the Lord. Some of them stopped working and stuff. Uh, the word quiet in this passage uh, speaks to our stewardship of our testimony. We, we, we personally huh, are responsible for our own testimony. Uh, it has to do with the nature of our reputation in the community. I mean, that's up to us. Amen. Uh, it's an encouragement not to be a person that generates conflict. You know how it is. Some folks go from one pot of confusion to another pot. Conflict after conflict. That's not supposed to be the life of a believer in Christ. Because Christians are stewards of what we do and what we say. Hmm. He also commands us to work and take care of ourselves and our families financially. So personally stewarding resources calls us to do our part to be self-supporting. That's the part of the verse that talks about working with our own hands. Be self-supporting rather than expecting a handout all the time. But then there's balance in scripture, amen? And so on the other hand, and sometimes for reasons beyond our control, we may face a setback and just need some help to pay a bill or whatever. During these times, it's okay to receive support from your family, friends, organizations, church, the government, whatever. Uh, and and y'all, that's the nature of where we are right now. The impact of COVID-19, so many folks losing jobs. Some folks need, amen? <laughs> they're, they're not being lazy. The focus of this stewardship key and, and, and this scripture from 1 Thessalonians from Paul is to help us see that the Lord commands us to be at peace as much as possible huh, with other folks. It, it, the, the, the focus is to help us to see not to exploit others and their generosity. And finally, to stand on our own as we work for what we get. We are stewards of our resources. <laughs> we determine how they're handled. And, and then the end of the text says, the benefit of this stewardship is that non-Christians will see and possibly be drawn because of our stewardship. Huh? Our stewardship can help us in our task of making disciples. Because righteousness draws folks. And good stewardship is righteous. The fifth principle here is we steward resources for saving. One thing about the pandemic, it has increased savings in America. <laughs> folks couldn't go out and spend as much, amen? And then some folks got their stimulus check and didn't have to spend it, and they saved it, amen? 
Look, James 4, 14, he, 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 he's talking about in that passage, he's talking about them presuming on tomorrow. OK, he's he's talking about, you know, you, 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 you can't presume on tomorrow. He says in a part of that verse, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. And that's the truth, isn't it? We don't know what is going to happen tomorrow. And, and so that causes us because we don't know what the future holds. We're going to be wise stewards and prepare ahead of time. Isn't that right? Uh, the Lord leads us to save for the futures. And I'm thinking about us being good stewards of our temples here because as we take care of our bodies, amen, we're preparing to be disciple makers for the future. It's not just saving money. I mean, we don't know when we're going to face hardship. We don't know, look, I shared this with my wife and the doctor the other day. Um, when I was 20, 21 years old, I was riding on the back of a motorcycle with a friend of mine. And I'd never ridden on a motorcycle before, okay? And so when he turned the corner, I thought we were about to fall. <laughs> he leaned that bike, man, I thought we were gonna fall. So I stuck my leg out. Today, that act comes back to haunt me. <laughs> I feel the pain. Now, I didn't feel it for about five, you know, five, ten seconds then. Hadn't felt it now. <laughs> I feel it every morning. <laughs> I'm just saying, we never know what tomorrow's going to bring. We got to do our best to take care of ourselves. Amen? Amen. We got to provide for ourselves the way God lays it out. <laughs> I mean, we've got to be careful too not to stress over our savings. <laughs> Talking about money here now. I mean, for some who are just beginning to work or some just getting started in their careers, some that find themselves overextended financially. We gotta fight the temptation to stress over that. We're not supposed to be stressed, amen? God calls us not to worry, isn't that right? Be anxious for nothing. We just gotta seek sound financial counsel and follow, amen, what we learn, amen? Follow the steps. And, and, and there's another side of the coin when saving can cause us to be tempted to sin in another way. As savings grow, we may begin to place our trust in those savings more than in the Lord. Our savings are never intended to be more trustworthy than Jesus, isn't that right? And we got to be careful not to let our love for our, 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 our saving balance uh, keep us from giving to the church, to those in need. I mean, think about it. How would you respond? And some folks have had to face this. Think about folks with Enron and other corporations. How do you, how do you respond when your 401k drops down to zero? Do you lose all hope? Or do you grieve for a little while and then continue to trust the Lord? It's not for us to do harm to ourselves because our saving balance goes to, go, goes to zero, y'all. Sixth principle. Not only do we steward resources for saving, we steward resources for giving. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7 but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Y'all, this life is not about, let me say that one more time. This life right now is not about how much we accumulate. 
is not. There's some stuff that can make this life more comfortable, but it's not about accumulating a whole bunch of stuff. Listen, it often makes people uncomfortable to discuss this, but you cannot argue that the Bible teaches you The Bible actually commands you to give generously to the Lord. And there's at least two reasons that we ought to obey as stewards in our giving. Financially, it's first, it's true. The size of the harvest is dependent on the amount of seed we sow. I mean, that's just a physical law of nature. What's exciting about this truth is that one seed of grain sown can produce a whole bushel of grain in return. Isn't that right? Spiritually, we sow a different seed, but the principle remains true. A little faith produces much. A seed seed sown sincerely produces much. But then there's a second reason for generous giving. That is that God loves our generosity. God here values not the size of your gift, but the sincerity of your heart in giving. We shouldn't give reluctantly. We know that. We need to be spontaneous in our giving. We we don't give from compulsion, but with a joyful, willing heart. Because we know God loves a cheerful giver. And again, there are many times we may be not able to give as much as we'd like, but the challenge is to steward our resources in such a way that we may at some point be able to give more. And that may mean we gotta cut back on our spending on other things. Sometimes the time we commit to other things so that we alleviate financial pressure and time pressure so that we have more to give to the Lord. The bottom line is This is not our home. We can't take it with us no no matter how much we accumulate. Listen, I'm I'm just about through, but did y'all hear the story about the guy who was saving money before he died? This guy was stuffing $20 bills, Pastor, into his mattress. Every extra 20 stuffed into his mattress. Year after year, stuffing 20s into his mattress. He got real sick, knew he was about to die. Told his wife, listen, when I die, I want you to get all the money out of the mattress and put it in the coffin with me. That's what he said. You know what the wife did when the man died? She went, got all the 20s out of the mattress like he asked her to. Took him to the bank, made a deposit, wrote a check, and put it in the coffin. <laughs> we, we can't take it with us, huh? We can't take it with us. God's given us to use it for his glory and the good of others. Finally, we steward resources for helping. Steward resources for saving, giving, helping. 1 John 3.17, God calls us to provide aid and assistance where we can. Huh? Huh? And, 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 and he's talking about us empowering folks, not enabling folks. Amen? You know what I'm talking about there? We, we're not allowing folks to get away with not doing. Amen. We're empowering them to be able to do more. That verse, 1 John 3, 17, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, doesn't help him, how does the love of God abide in him? 
In this text, our stewardship is seen in sacrificially doing what we can to meet the needs of fellow believers. God expects us to look to help, and, and we, we, we know that. We just have to keep it in the forefront of our minds. As, as a steward of the resources God gives you, you will need to manage them in such a way that you're positioned to help meet the needs of others. That's why we don't have to accumulate so much for ourselves. Stewardship in this verse is an expression of love from one believer to another believer, helping brothers and sisters in Christ. Providing for others can include monetary gifts, foods, clothing, just being hospitable with what we have, giving of ourselves, spending time, discipling, encouraging, and supporting. There's all kinds of ways. When it comes to helping others, God desires for you to take care of your family, 1 Timothy 5.8, your church, 1 Timothy 5.17 and 18, and those in need, Matthew 25, 35, and 40. Now, before I sit down, this sacrificial stewardship reflects the fact we are not conformed to or molded by the ways and values of this era, this age, this world in which we live. No. Instead, we have been and continue to be, what? Transformed by the renewing of our minds. Huh? By a renewed, heavenly focus, scripture-infused mind. The word leads and guides our minds. A mind by which we see more clearly that it is really important. Hmm. So we adjust our lives accordingly. A mind fit for eternal ages, not just a moment because of the Holy Spirit being our guide. Y'all remember that little game they teach the kids to play, uh, do the hokey pokey. You know how it says you stick your right hand, elbow in and put your right elbow out? Y'all know that. Huh? Put your right leg in and your right leg out. You know how that hokey pokey ends? Put your whole, somebody said it, <laughs> put your whole self in. Y'all, that's stewardship. That's stewardship. Not a piece, not an not a elbow, not an ear. We got to put our whole self, y'all. This morning, as stewards of God, let us recommit ourselves to live using all we have for his glory. None of us, none of it really belongs to us anyway. I heard a preacher say one time, uh, you drive to the restaurant in your car and somebody going to drive off in your car. <laughs> so steal it and drive off in your, you know, it's not really. But there will come a time, amen, we'll receive all that God has for us in another place. So if you would stand with me, I want to offer an invitation to those who may not understand, may not have received the joy of Christ in their lives. Just want to let you know that we all fall short of God's glory. That is the mark that God sets for our lives. We all fall short. And because of that, we're dependent on his mercy to be able to make it to eternity in his presence. No one is guaranteed that privilege. The key is trusting Jesus' death on the cross for your sins. We ask this morning that you would give yourself to Jesus. You have both physical, material, and spiritual gifts that God wants to use for his glory. Won't you surrender to him? Christ will shape you and mold you and make you more beautiful than you are. 
in your spirit, in your inner man, that you might give for his glory. Eternal God, we thank you for what our eyes have seen, for what our ears have heard, what our hearts have felt. Help us now to walk in what this word has said to us. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us now, henceforth, and forevermore. Let us all say together, Amen.